If there's one word I could use to describe our next guest, I think it's multifaceted. She's a woman who has accomplished many great things. She's the founder of the Chair Center, a Nigerian powerhouse furniture company. She's a motivational speaker. She's been an actress even. She also does what I do. She hosts a television show. There's so much I could say about this woman, but I think we'll let you hear for yourselves from her. Her name is Ibokuin Awoshika, and she's our guest right here on Breakfast Daily. Good morning. Good morning. Well, How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm well, thank you. And you? Great. I'm okay. I'm great. She <laughs> missed out my favorite title. You are officially ordained minister yes, of God. Yes, she is. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have, we've got a lot of inspiration coming in this morning, honestly. She wears so many hats, but we're so grateful to have you here. Thank you. And we know you're, you're extremely busy, but let's get right into it. Now, for anyone who, for some reason, has missed the greatness of what you are and who you do, or, or who you are and what you do, please tell us a bit about your background um, growing up in Nigeria and all of the, the, the steps you went through to make it to where you are today. So we'll start off with where you grew up and your education. Okay. So thank you very much for having me. And um, I definitely was not going to say no <laughs> to come here because okay. Sama is my friend. You and I mentioned. love him and his spirit Aww. very much. So I wanted to put that on the table. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, I grew up in Nigeria, um, the third child of a Nigerian father and a Cameroonian mother. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm a black half caster. That's our joke. That's our joke. That's how we call each other. Wow. So we're black half cast, <laughs> you know. And um, went to school. Well, in early days, I grew up with my grandmother because my, my dad went to school in England and my mom was pregnant with me. And then she waited to have me. And uh, a little while after, she went to join her husband and they thought taking a little baby was uh, so anyway they left me my grandmother which served my purpose mm. because you know I was very much loved and uh, you know how grandmothers raise children they dote yes. on, on the yes. grannies yes spoilt and uh, doted on in that way but what I've even realized more in the journey of my life was the wisdom of old mm. that was imparted, mm. which at many points in time, my friends always laugh, is because you were raised by your grandmother. <laughs> you know, you think like an old woman mm. in some ways, but that served me in many ways. I then had primary school education in between the northern part of Nigeria and uh, the southwest, mm. and went to Methodist Girls High School, mm. which is uh, in Lagos. It's mm. the oldest female school, oh. uh, secondary mm. school in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Uh, created in 1879, oh. hmm. you know, so went to Methodist Girls High School, had a lot of fun at school. I used to do everything. I was uh, not an athlete, yes. you know, I was in the school's team, I think from my second year. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to debate for the hmm. school from my third year in, in secondary school. Uh, I used to act, you know, just school plays, yes. just get involved with that. And uh, I still found ways to be academically uh, efficient mm -hmm. and then i went to university of ife which is above Femi Ulo university well i started out in secondary school wanting to be a doctor then found yes. out that they use real dead bodies <laughs> in i read that in your book and yeah. I thought that was hilarious yes because i just don't know i'm not doing this there's no way i'm messing around with dead bodies so i changed my mind and decided i wanted to be an architect because mm -hmm. i was both a good science student and a good art uh, student. But anyway, I went into university to study chemistry. By the end of my first year of chemistry, I hated it. <laughs> and so I decided, no, I don't think I can do this. That mm -hmm. Everybody says I'll make a great lawyer because I was a good debater. I, okay. I think I won the uh, speaker's contest or something mm. for Lagos State then. I know everybody knew I could win an argument. So <laughs> I thought, okay, maybe they have a good idea. So I used to go and sit outside the door of the dean of law wanting to be a law to transfer to law i think his secretary told him eventually look there's one girl that comes to sit here waiting to see you have to see her so the guy said okay let her come <laughs> what do you want and i said i'd like to transfer to law he looked at me really i said yes sir he said that's why you've been sitting outside my office mm -hmm. i said yes sir he said hmm, i like your guts <laughs> <laughs> if I take no one else from any other department next session, it'd be, I will take you. But make sure you pass very well. Well, therein lies my problem. Because oh. if you pass very well, mm. your department will, will not release you. We also yeah. won't want you to go. And if you fail, 
law will not, not take, take me. You. So I had a catch-99 situation. <laughs> but the funny thing is, I didn't even have to deal with both. I, myself, decided by the end of the session I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. Mm. Oh, oh, after wow. all that? After all that, you know. So when I teach young people, I always say to them, look, hmm. have fun. Because okay. if you think you know where you're going yet, hmm. you'll be surprised yeah. at how your journey can be a journey of some accidents that mm. then lead you to a place where you fully realize who you are. Mm. So I was the most confused young girl trying to find myself, mm. Mm. you know. So I then decided, no, I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. I wanted to be a chartered accountant so I could go and work in a bank. <laughs> From medicine <laughs> to yeah. law <laughs> to, to accounting. To chemistry. To, and then, yeah, I mean, the chem yeah, then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, so I remained in my chemistry department okay. and started taking all the free electives I could in admin and accounting. From part two to part four, I took their subjects. Did very w did better in them than my the chemistry, chemistry. <laughs> chemistry <laughs> subjects. Anyway, I graduated with my BSc in chemistry. You, you don't get a minor degree in Nigeria, otherwise I should have gotten one for the accounting. Okay. But I was then determined to serve. You have to serve our government in Nigeria for one year. Yes. Yeah. Like, a national, national service. Service. like a national service. Mm. So I was determined that the secondary part of it would be in an accounting firm. Okay. So when I got to, I served in the northern part of Nigeria. And so when they were posting us, they first sent me to a school. And I knew I was not going to teach. I wanted to work in an accounting firm based on my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to this school, just swore it was a, a, a Muslim school. So it wasn't about it being Muslim, but it was about what I knew, how they thought. Mm. So I just wore a dress off my shoulder. Mm. I went to the school to report. What do you think happened? Oh, they, they rejected me. You can't me. come in here with your shoulder So exposed. they just rejected me. And which served my purpose. So once they rejected me, I went back. <laughs> you intentionally got yourself rejected. <laughs> yes. And went back to NYSC to say, well, they rejected me, so you're going to have to post me to somewhere else. But I know exactly where I want to go to. And I have a letter from them that says that uh, they would take me. <laughs> so I sat outside the door of that room for three days. Well, you know, I had good practice. Yeah, exactly. Good trying to get a good job. <laughs> so I sat outside the door for three days until they came and said, what exactly do you want? And I showed them the letter. And they posted me there. Oh, wow. Well, that's not the surprise. <laughs> because by the end of the one year of youth service, I hated auditing. So <laughs> I, I, I realized that it was really boring for me, okay, because... They already had processes they yes. had prepared. Yeah. You didn't have to use you your to brain much. Anything. You yeah. just had to follow these yeah. processes. Yeah. I'm the most restless human being in the world. <laughs> and if oh, my brain isn't functioning, then there's a problem. A, okay. Mm. You know, so it was not challenging or fun for me. I did my job. You know, I have a policy. Whatever your hand finds to do, do, do it, it well. well. Yeah. So I applied myself excellently that they even offered me a permanent employment. It's, mm -hmm. I can tell I Williams, which now became Deloitte. So it's Deloitte. Uh, Nigeria, mm -hmm. and I said no I don't want your job because I already know this is not what I want to do. do I still want to work in a bank but I don't want to be an accountant mm. anymore wow. I started registered for the exams and all I abandoned and all of it. that and, and I went and back home I have to ask though so yeah you're a young woman in I was in my 20s 80s 70s yeah. 80s Nigeria it was 80s making all of these intrepid mm. decisions about yeah. your career and your life yeah Honestly, I'm sure there were a lot of people looking at you thinking, who does this young woman think she is? You know, she's supposed to be on a certain trajectory. You know, why, why is she so resistant to the norm? Why, why is she so, as you said, what, you, you, did you say you're uh, the most confused or the most restless, restless. restless person? Yes. You know, did you get that kind of pushback from family, from, from other people who Look, were... I, I think that I'm forever grateful to my parents mm. and to my father in particular because he had he was ahead of his time in terms of parenting hmm. mm. he had a very open-minded uh, way to what we wanted to do mm. and who we wanted to be and he sort of encouraged my self-expression you know because when I finished f um, when I said I wasn't taking the job yes. at uh, I can tell at Williams Deloitte I came back home and I wanted to get any job mm. as my first job. And within a week, the first job I got was in a furniture company. Okay. Mm. So I never thought about furniture before in my life. 
I went there just to kill time <laughs> whilst waiting for my bank job. And this was the 80s where a whole load of new generation banks were being started in Nigeria. Yeah. All the GT, Zenith yeah. and all of that, they as you see, they all that. started yeah. then, you know, because that's when the government was licensing these. New. So there were a lot of new banking jobs that mm -hmm. were coming. So I was sure that I will get one. get one of them. But I didn't want to sit at home. I was already making my own money during youth service. Mm. You know, I had... I was doing voiceover on TV. <laughs> I was doing a uh, presentation of a commercial program. I was running an exercise class. So I was a rich copper, <laughs> you know, because I was a very enterprising copper, you know. So I didn't want to go and start asking my father for money. So mm. I took this job in an industry I had no interest in, but thought I had no interest in. But remember, mm. architecture was part of my options. Yes. So design and all of that was something I thought of. But I lasted only three and a half months in the company. Mm. However, as you can see, I've spent the last 33 years building a manufacturing group yes. with furniture being a major yeah. part of our business. Mm. In those three and a half months, that whole part of me that wanted to study architecture, the creative and design part, came alive. And I saw that I loved what could be done with the business, but I didn't like the value system mm. of that company. I was an mm. idealistic young woman in many ways. Right. And I thought I can do this and do it right. Okay. okay. So I left wow. the company and went to start on my own. On your own. I was, it was just before my 26th birthday. In your hmm? mid-20s, you yes. take the decision to start a major furniture company. And when people are talking about people who make furniture, automatically the, the assumption is, oh, it's a male or, you know, a, a, the MD is probably a man. Yeah. But I understand even when you were approaching banks for funding and things, people were surprised to see a young woman in her 20s yeah. coming in looking it for funding. It was always about, oh, it's one girl. Yes. But it then paid to my advantage because, you know, being different and there were very, I think there were about two, three, four of us that were girls that were starting out about the same time. Mm. You know, the funny thing is all the guys who started with us about the same time, those businesses are dead. All the girls are, are largely still in the business. Wow. So that says something about the tenacity. Yeah, resilience. The resilience yeah. of women, women. Yeah. to build for the long term. Yeah. And you must never underestimate it. Mm. You know, that's how I started. What do you... When you think of what you've done with the Chair Center, 33 years, what are you most proud of? That we're still here. Mm. <laughs> Have you been You've survived to, everything. Yeah, because in my country, you go to bed at night mm. and you wake up in the morning and it can be a different terrain <laughs> simply by some announcement you missed the night before. Wow. Mm. You know, and so your ability to... I remember one of my uh, foreign business associates asking me in 2003 said to me, look, I'd been in business for like 15 years or so then, mm. or 16 years. I was in business school in Spain. I was doing my executive MBA. And one night, the government announces a change of policy that literally was going to shut down my hmm. business, business as I knew it. Mm -hmm. And I was home from school at that point in Nigeria. And it was one of the two founders of Guarantee Trust Bank, Tayo Adirioko, who called me and said, have you listened to the news? I said, no, I'm studying. I have schoolwork. And he said, no, government just shut down uh, your business. I said, eh. He said, what do you mean by eh? I said, no, <laughs> don't worry, bro, tire that, you know, it will be well. I said, really? <laughs> I said, yes. So I left, went to my husband and said, uh, this is what I said. And he said, eh. So we went back to listen to the recap of the news and heard what the government had done. So I went back, I, I, I just said to my, so I went to the office the next morning and my staff were all in a bit. I said, everybody calm down, don't panic. I, look, I just need you to pray for wisdom for me and that I will not fire anybody. We're going to work through this. Hmm. So I went to understand clearly what the government was trying to do. And to be fair, they wanted a lot more local production in order to create jobs for our people, which is a fair That, that thing. is fair. Yes. However... Many factors make it, we were largely a local manufacturing company, started with 100% production in Nigeria. <laughs> and at a stage, a desire and a dream to deliver international quality product consistently made me use opportunities that were available globally as processes for manufacturing were changing. Mm. So we designed our own collection and we found OEM companies mm. in five 
countries around the world, from Asia to Europe, who were then producing components for us. Okay. We'll bring all the components back into our own factory, okay. and based on our own collection, we can mix and match. Mm, right. It was a major part of how we grew, because it allowed us to respond to the market. Now, you must always understand the trends in the market where you are. Mm. In our market, most Nigerians plan to build a 10-story building, mm -hmm. but they think about the furniture one month to the opening <laughs> of the building. Mm. You know, so yeah. you had that trait that could become a key business advantage. Okay. The fact that people don't plan long term meant that at the point that they need the furniture, they're looking for whoever can meet their need at that point. So yeah. whoever has the stock, sometimes they will buy what is not the best fit because that's what's available. Mm. So we took that problem yeah. and identified that if we, were, if we had CKD components produced for us from around and we had our own collection, we would do your space plan for your space, design what you need, but we had different components that we could mix and match mm. to create a, a line right. for any office building in any way. And that just, that just meant okay. we took every project okay. as was possible. And then uh, we moved on. So when government had this policy, quite a number of our components were going to fall within it because it meant they were essentially changing the model mm. that we had built mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And so... Mm. I walked through it and decided, okay, let me go back and approach some of the guys we work with. So the first company I went to <coughs> is the largest French manufacturer of office seating, okay. uh, Socwa, SA of France. Okay. And I said to them, look, you've been producing for us for the last 10 years. We're in your top 10 dealership in the world. They mm. are one of the top 10 companies in the world in their segment. I said, come into Nigeria with me and let's set up uh, a joint venture together and we can take the sub-Saharan market. And they laughed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> French company thinking, oh, what's this Nigerian woman talking about? <laughs> but I delivered value to them for 10 years. <sighs> so you must always learn how to own the value yeah. you have. Yeah. And you must trade yeah. with it when you need to. Mm -hmm. So they, they laughed and thought, well, you know, we produce largely, we sell around the world, but we produce largely in France and around us mm. uh, in Europe. We've never produced out of Africa or any other place outside of Europe. So. How are we going to go and produce in Nigeria? So I said, well, you know, you join up with me for us to do this, and we'll do it well. You don't, I will do it without you anyway. <laughs> Not because I already knew how, mm. but I knew whichever way I was going to solve the problem. And I think they knew that. Mm. So I left. And uh, about two weeks after they came back to me and said, you know what, Mr. Oshika, we will work with you. We'll do 5% investment, and then we'll do a joint venture you know, to help you set up. See, sometimes when the Lord opens a window, mm. take it. Yeah. Because once you take the window, eventually you kick the door down. Mm. So I, I said yes. And <coughs> for the next, like, four months, we were building the plan. And by the time, I think about four months after, they called me one day and said, you know, our board just met and we've decided we're going to increase our investment to 21%. From wow. five. From 5%. <laughs> and we will give you every technical support that, that you need. need. Wow. So I, we got a team together, sent them to France. They were in France for about three, four months. They were trained to be the nucleus uh, team that would uh, handle the production in our factory. They did all the buying of our equipment and our machinery uh, for us. We got other investors. Uh, in fact, it was Guarantee Trust at that point that then invested uh, 20, they took 32% of the company, two individuals did 5 percentage. Mm -hmm. I took 37% of that company, and bam. And I already had a, the retail arm of my business, which mm -hmm. gave us the market. So that's mm -hmm. how we, we started producing no, that. Throughout mm -hmm. your submission, you've, you've mentioned God, you've mentioned your faith. Talk to us about the role that faith has played in your journey. And you were raised as a Muslim, but you're now an ordained minister. So tell yeah. us about that journey. Well, the thing is, I went to Christian schools all my life. Not that that uh, affected me in any way because I was a very arrogant Muslim girl. Really? You know, who thought, okay, you guys keep your stuff and keep me. I'm here as a student. Let me face uh, my academics. And in fact, when I finished my O-levels, I was the valedictorian for my year because I read the Bible passage in church <laughs> oh. for the graduation for the service oh. for my year. I was the Muslim girl. But, you know, the thing about our journey with God is 
I, I think God must have a great sense of humor. I think mm. it has a good time <laughs> sitting in heaven and just laughing at us because <laughs> there you are thinking you have a good idea of wh where you're going, what's going to be, and then along the line you find out that someone had a plan yeah. all along and he will execute his plan. Mm. So I did meet the Lord in the course of my life. I wasn't, it was before, I, just before I got married. So I wasn't looking for a husband. Okay. I already had a manufacturing business. I had 28 workers working for me. So for all intents and purposes, I was set up to be successful as a young woman. I'm still in my 20s. Mm. And um, it was a, a scenario that played out. You know, a friend of my, my uh, friend's mother, I had to deliver a message to her mom. From I came from England, and she sent me to deliver some stuff. Anyway, one thing led to the other. My youngest sister... I uh, was ill. We were the only ones at home. My dad was in Cameroon. My mom was in England. And, you know, I was the oldest one around okay. to look out for her. And uh, she suddenly fell uh, very ill. And I didn't know what to do. So I called my friend's mom. And she and her pastor came to church, to the hospital, to pray for my sister. Mm. And, uh, and the woman who came with um, her had asked me, because we met her when I went to my friend's house to deliver a message. And she asked me, um, do you go to church? And I said, no. You know, and all of that. She said, okay, you know, just find your own way with God and all of that. She didn't push. Okay. But she left a word, you know, that left an impression with me. So when I found myself in that situation with my sister being very ill and myself trying to figure out what to do, I called my friend's mom. And my friend's mom came with her. And after they finished praying and all of that, I asked them, where is your church? Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity. And then my youngest sister and I decided on the Sunday, let's even just go to this their church mm. and go and see. And then we got there. And at a point, they asked them to pray for my sister who was in hospital. And I saw these people pray like their lives depended, depended on, on it. it. Wow. People who didn't know me, didn't know my sister, didn't know her family. Why were they praying mm -hmm. so fervently? You know, like my sister's life was so important to them. And I found it very fascinating that at the point that they made the altar call, I didn't know how I got up and went to the front. Mm -hmm. And you know the interesting thing? When I started making the confession of faith, to give my life, I started speaking in tongues. Hmm. So I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the same time as I was confessing to become wow. a Christian. And so that's what started my journey. And my whole family, including my father, became a Christian. They all converted. Amazing. My dad became a Christian as an allergy two months to his 60th birthday wow. and served the Lord till he died at 87. Wow. Hmm. We're speaking with the book Uma Wushika. I, I just got chills hey, hey, listening hey. to that. But there's something else I'd love to go into. You've written a few books. Um, one of them, you talk about quotes from different speeches that you've given, different things you've written. And you talk a lot about marriage and the importance of carefully choosing a partner. Now, this might be a, a, a mini relationship segment, but you, you've really made some profound statements on what it takes to choose a partner and not to be foolish in those choices. And for young women out there who are worried about pursuing careers, you know, emulating the kind of success that you've achieved and what that means for their personal and family lives, let, let's talk about what the thought process that should go into that and whether or not they should give up on trying to find that partner or that spouse that will support their vision for their career? Okay, first and foremost, I think one of the greatest disservice you would do to yourself is to marry the wrong person for you. Mm. In my books, your spouse is a key success factor, whether you're a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. And choosing, but it's even more important for a woman mm. because men have more room to navigate okay. mm. than a woman does. Because in the context of our own culture, yes. our African culture, mm. yes. she's expected, and in biblical terms, she's expected to be submissive mm. to her husband. Now, you better be sure that the guy you want to submit you, your life mm. to and have to answer to is a guy who has the capacity to handle you to handle the life of who you, you are, are. Mm -hmm. yeah. now it's almost impossible in many ways to tell where your journey will end when my husband and i met i was a young ambitious woman 
trying to build a furniture company. It was my first year in business. But he could see that I, I was going somewhere. Mm. But that's the most he probably could see in terms of, okay, I'll probably build this business and make it successful. Mm. And he was very supportive even from then. But a season came in the context of Nigeria and the value system with which I'd built my business and pursued my life became a key attraction as corporate governance became a major thing in corporate Nigeria. And I got more invitation than I knew what to do with to serve on boards. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, suddenly I'm serving on the board of Cadbury, I'm serving uh, on this board, and then I get appointed to the board of First Bank, yes. and then I'm appointed to chair uh, the board of their startup insurance company, which is a joint venture between First Bank and Salam, uh, um, FBN Life Insurance as uh, the Pioneer Chair. Two years, we were a successful, profitable company. And then I was moved from there to chair their investment bank, which is FBN Capital. I was on that project for three years. Between that time, we uh, encouraged the group to let us buy Kakawa Discount House. And we bought Kakawa Discount House, and they asked me to double chair. So I was chairing the board of FBN, uh, the board of FBN Capital, chairing the board of uh, Kakawa Discount House. And we merged those two together to create what is our FBN Quest Group, which is our investment banking group for the FBN Holding Group. And at the end of that, I was then appointed to become the first female chair in 122 years history of First hmm. Bank of Nigeria. Yeah. Now, the reality is, because of the systemic, uh, systemic importance of First Bank in Nigeria's economy, mm -hmm. And the fact that it's the oldest corporate institution in West Africa, most Nigerians think of it as a national asset, even though it's a, pri it's a publicly quoted company, but it's owned by shareholders. Yeah. It's not government yeah. owned mm -hmm. or anything. So it's not a national, it's a national asset by its history, but it's not a national asset because government doesn't own it. It's mm -hmm. owned by uh, a few million shareholders who, who own the company. But so there, there's a lot that's tied to it in mm. terms of, and then you're building all of the rest of your life along. Now, the reality is the guy who married you as this young 20-something-year-old woman, <laughs> uh, old girl who had ambition, could just not have imagined this where place. the magnitude of yes. your success. And I'm still in my 50s, so mm. I still have <laughs> more to go. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's just the reality <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah. Now, if the guy does not have the capacity to grow with, with you, you well. with mm. your vision, mm. with your ambition, mm. and as you emerge, mm. there will be problems. Mm. So and <laughs> I've watched many women struggle. Mm. In fact, so I am forever grateful to the man that I call my husband because I have seen his commitment to the full emergence of who I am. Yeah. The, Sometimes it's tough mm. because, you know, sometimes outsiders make it difficult for your spouse yeah. you know, and all of that, especially when you're, you're, you're a woman. But in all of those things, it makes me understand why it's really important yeah. that as a young woman, I always say to young women, don't make a choice of a spouse until you have a sense of who you are. Okay. Because if you do, then you, it's easier for you to consider other things other than he's rich, tall, and handsome. Okay. <laughs> now, 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 <laughs> now like talking about the, the, the being on boards and, you know, high flying and still having uh, your, the support of your husband who is also having to grow along so that he can handle who it is that you're actually becoming. Because, like you said, I don't think you've become. No, no. You're becoming, yeah. right? I want to find out what your husband's reaction was to this that we're about to see. Let's take a look at this video. Tell you see. Nation to truly be great. The integrity of every man that is sitting at this table as a governor or a governor-elect is critical to our nation building. You need to own your own vision for your life. You need to decide what you want your legacy to be. And you have the opportunity from this moment to build that legacy by the things you do every day. There will be people that will seek to derail you. But by being confident of who you are and making the decision that I will live true to how I was brought up, to my values, to what is right for my country, to what is right for my people. That I want to be able to walk freely amongst my people even when I'm done and I'm old and tired. When you think with that determination, your 
actions will change things for people. You might not do everything. You will not do everything. Just choose roads. Choose education. Choose health. Make your contract clear with your state. Let them know how resources cannot cover all of this. These are the only things I will do in the next four years and deliver on those things. Once you're clear and your people understand, they will stand by you and defend you in the day of trouble. And at the end of the day, you will get much more than any money that anybody can pay you. We all want this country to work and we're very hopeful that because you have this position and you have this power and people have trusted you with it, that you will use it effectively to build a nation, the portion of it that is assigned to you, and that you will work collectively for the unity of this nation. Because a nation that is divided against itself, it can never stand. But in the place of unity, I'm a Christian. The Bible says God has commanded his blessings, which means every time we combine our knowledge, our wisdom, and all our resources together, we can build a great nation that the world will be afraid of. I want my nation to work. I want to be able to tell my children, this is why I'm saying to you, you must live in Nigeria and no, nowhere else. And I ask for your help, that as you do what you have sworn to do or you will swear to do as you take office, that the Lord will help you to do it right but that ultimately we will build a nation that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Okay, can you, can you come and address our parliament, please? <laughs> because after watching that, I think you need to come and speak so to... So this is a room full of governors. <laughs> yes. And they are <laughs> applauding you. Did you have a conversation... Or did your husband have a conversation with you after that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, I think when you marry a woman, you have to know her enough. And when you love her for who she is, and you have the gift and the capacity to be her support and her backbone, you will be there, even when you think she might be vulnerable. Every time, and I mean, I, I speak on national issues quite a bit. I have learned that you have to have the courage of conviction. Mm. Mm. And if we are going to change our countries, we all have to have the courage to speak. But speak in a way that we carry everybody along. Mm. Not speak in a way that you are antagonistic and yeah. you declare war. Because then, nobody will hear what you're saying anymore. Mm. Every time I'm on a national talk like that, doing something. My husband, wherever he is, his phone is ringing <laughs> back and forth. Because there'll be people calling, have you seen your wife? Have you seen your wife is this? Your wife is saying that. Your wife, you know, people calling his attention. But I can almost tell you, if I open my phone and show you how many well done, well spoken mm. messages mm. I received from my husband mm. after many such yes. sessions mm. that that, mm. I, that I do because he knows the things that are important to mm. me. You must leave your values in your home because mm. your first constituency that must be able to speak for you yeah. and trust what you say, yeah. the people you sleep with and yeah. live with. Yeah. Mm. You know, between my, I have three sons, mm. my okay. men as I call them, my mm. four <laughs> men, my husband and my three men, always find it within themselves to say, well done, mommy. Mm. You did a great job. Mm. You spoke the truth. And they give me the courage and the confidence to be myself. Mm. Because I have, by my own actions and my consistency, even in secret in my mm. home, I've earned their respect and their trust. Wow. And that makes it easier wow. to be yourself. So it's I possible think. to have it all. I yeah. always say you can play to win. You must know. It's why I am so particular about talking to young people mm. about spouse, because it's, it's a key success factor. Okay. It's a major component of playing to win. Mm. I mean, when there are days you can't show up for your children, mm. but if you have a spouse who understands your life mm. and you step in for each other yeah. in those moments. Then you're a team, yeah. which is what you're meant to, to be. be. Remember yeah. the Bible says, and the two ace, mm. ace one, mm. 
you know, it's one, which means whether it's this or this. It's woven. One fabric. It's one yeah. at work. Yes. One for another. Mm -hmm. Working to protect the vision of another. If I succeed, did you notice the name on the screen? It says Ibukwa Awoshika. What yes. is my father's name? It is not Awoshika. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my father's name is Adekola. He paid my school fees. Okay. He taught me the values that gave me the foundation. And he built me up to be able to take on the world in the way that I have had the opportunity to. But I then signed on to the Awoshika name hmm. because I fell in love with a young man from the Awoshika family. And the name I take around the world doing the things I do is their name. Mm. Mm. So guess what? We both win. We both win. We, both win. we win. And it's, it's important. I always say to men, only a foolish man mm. does not understand if he puts his wife down, that he puts himself Look down. down. Mm. That's one. Two, the Bible says your wife is your helper. <laughs> the quality of the help you get is the quality of the yeah. helper you allow to emerge. Yeah. Mm. If you allow your wife to be the best of herself, you get the value for it. In your day of trouble, you know, men run into trouble. Businesses yes. go wrong. Careers can get stopped. You can lose jobs. You can have crisis. You can. But imagine a team of a husband and wife that are both doing well. When one is down, the other holds up. Yeah. When one is up, the other one supports. You have an incredible team that creates value for you. So your wife is your asset, your God-given asset mm. that is meant to bless your life. If you allow her to be the best of herself, mm. you get the best helper in your day of trouble. Yeah. And you know, the men will build great businesses but leave their wives behind. And then mm. they die. Strangers take their Keep asset yeah. because they didn't prepare mm. a woman or a household to, that can continue. And yeah. their children so far. I've seen many families Thank that that happened to. So Thank you. Thank I you. wish we could have you for it. Well, yeah, I know, right? Except that we my husband will be here for this. <laughs> we have to go back home. Yes. It's been such a pleasure. Yes. Such a privilege. Thank pleasure. you again. Thank you. Thank for you. gracing really our set you. with your wisdom and with okay. your grace. And it was fantastic seeing you at the EWN conference yesterday, which yeah, is, which is why you're here in Accra. Amazing women. Amazing women. Amazing Kudos women. To them. So Ghana is blessed. Just make sure you make the most of them. Amen. Because if you have 50-50% population men and women, only a foolish businessman mm. does not maximize 50% of its assets. Mm. So if you have great women Good words. Words. in this country, Wise words. use mm. them for the benefit of the country. Thank you. Speaking truth to power, yep. Ibo Kuna Woshika, thank you so much once again. My pleasure.